and welcome to my fifth annual uh, Thanksgiving Eve service. Uh, this is the fifth year in a row that I've done this. I did lose my voice um, this afternoon. Of course, as loud as y'all know my normal speaking voice is, I probably actually just sound like a normal person right now, and I don't sound like I'm yelling at you. But I'm very excited to be here this year. Um, and you can see by my sermon title, it's called Friendsgiving, a Thanksgiving Sermon. Uh, every year on the TV sitcom Friends, instead of doing like a standard Christmas special, they would do a Thanksgiving special. So in addition to celebrating Thanksgiving with their families off screen, they would also host Thanksgiving parties with their uh, friends on screen. And I thought this was a pretty cool idea. If, there, if we have Halloween and Christmas parties, why not also have a Thanksgiving party? So fans of the show have started calling this Friendsgiving, and every single year this has grown more and more popular. So this year was the first time that I have ever done one of these parties. This is a picture of what ours looked like this past year. Um, you can kind of see me in the middle right there of the picture. And so I just want to say that um, I'm truly grateful to have this group of friends. Um, some of these people I've known for most of my life. Some of them I've known for about a decade and some I've just met in the past couple years. And all of this got me thinking, um, who are the friends in our lives? Well, I've came up with some different categories to kind of classify how I see different friends in my life. And so I decided to start all the way back at the very beginning, uh, before I even existed. So God is the friend that loved you before you were conceived. And let me show you what I mean by that. The prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5a, uh, God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Of course, the context of this verse is talking about how God chose Jeremiah to be his holy prophet before Jeremiah was even born. However, this does not make this basic truth any less true for me or for you. The truth is God loved you before you were born. Not mankind generically, but you individually. Each and every soul is the Lord's creation. King David, in Psalms chapter 139, verse 16, King David says this, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God knows everything about you because God made everything that makes you, you. While God's knowledge of everything about us is not going to affect our free will to choose, but I do believe that means that we should listen very closely to what God has to say. Because after all, God literally knows the best decisions for us to make. And I think that we should listen to him very closely. So God is the first friend that we've had before we were even born. He loves us as his creation. The next friends group that I think that you encounter early on in your life is your family. Uh, when I was born, well, really before I was even born, uh, my parents already loved me. They already kind of had my room laid out and I already had a bunch of family who was excited to get to meet me. Um, there were even some people here who were excited to get to meet me. So before I was born and even knew what a friend was, I already had a group of people here that cared a lot about me. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, um, Paul says this about Timothy's family. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelled in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Thank God for godly parents and for godly grandparents. I know that I am very thankful for mine. And if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about my family for a little bit. You can see on the picture up here, on the left side of the screen, you'll see my granddaddy, um, who died before I was born. And on the right side of the screen, you'll see my grandmother. These are my mom's parents. 
Uh, many of you members who have been here for a while, I'm sure remember both of them very well. My granddaddy actually served as an elder here, and even though he did die before I was born, his faith made a huge impact on my life. And of course, I remember my grandmother very well, and I remember that she always had those really good little hard strawberry candies that she would give to us grandkids. And for me, this is kind of the history of where I believe my faith first started. It was their faith that dwelt in them, was passed on to my mom, and then was passed on to me. And this is the legacy they left behind. Um, even though some of us are now separated by distance, one of us is separated by death, I am thankful for each and every person in these photographs and for those who aren't in there as well. Um, I would say that I'm truly blessed. As you can tell by how skinny I am in that top left-hand picture, it's been a long time since we've had a picture taken together, um, but that still doesn't diminish the fact that each of them means a lot to me. Uh, we definitely do need to take an updated picture sometime soon. Now this is my dad's side of the family. This is when we all met together, I would say for around spring time, around March or so. And so from a very early age, you can see my grandparents sitting right there in the middle. They taught me um, how much that Jesus loved me. A couple of years ago, my grandmother gifted me with this uh, old family Bible. You can see that it's starting to fall apart. But this is a very special gift to me. And you can see where in here my grandfather gave it to my grandmother about six months before my dad was born. And then you can see here in 2019 that she gave it to me. In here has a lot of cool family history and it also has some really neat study notes. And so I wanted to bring this as a sermon illustration just to kind of show you that on both sides of my family, um, faith has been very important to us. My dad has been a deacon at Oak Hill for as long as I can remember before he became an elder. I remember that he would spend countless hours up here at the church building. He would be getting the fellowship hall ready for events like VBS or the fall festival. And now that he is older, he's an elder, and I'm very blessed to have this legacy. My mom, from, a, from ever since I was a kid, has always been helping out with the children's ministry as well. And she still to this day does teach some Sunday school classes. This is not to say that I wouldn't have became a Christian um, if my family were not Christians, but it certainly has helped a lot. I've actually been told numerous times by both of my parents that their number one goal for me was to become a Christian. And I am glad to say that me and all my brothers have um, done our part in that. So to all of you parents out there, I challenge you to be this legacy for your children. And to future parents out there, like some of us young guys here, um, I challenge you to study and prepare to one day yourselves raise young Christian men and women. Deuteronomy is the last book of the Pentateuch. It was Moses' farewell sermon that he did. And he had this to say in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. He said, These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. I am thankful that my parents taught me about the Lord. Before I knew my ABCs, I knew who Jesus was, and I knew that he loved me. And the older I got, of course, my faith became my own, but these seeds of faith were planted by them. Now, if you did not grow up in a household of faith, here is my advice to you. Replace the word children here where it says impress on your children. Replace it with the word girlfriend, boyfriend, aunt, uncle, parent. So impress them on your girlfriend, impress them on your boyfriend, impress them on your parents. That is my challenge to you. Do not underestimate how the power of your example can have an impact on your family. A good example can soften the hearts to the gospel's message.
And next, we're going to be talking about friends as the family that you choose. I know this has kind of became like a catchy thing that a lot of people are saying these days, but this is not just a new thing that people have started thinking about. This is actually all the way back from the Old Testament times. The Bible often refers to our friends as our family, such as Psalms 133 verse 1 says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Proverbs 18 24 says, Friends come and friends go, but a true fan sticks by you like family. So we can see by these verses that this is not a new concept, this is a very ancient concept. Probably the best and most famous example in the Bible comes from the friendship between David and his friend Jonathan. David considered his friend Jonathan as dear to him as a brother. They weren't biological brothers, but they were brothers in a spiritual sense. Notice what David says here. He says, My brother Jonathan, you have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Both David and Jonathan, they had biological siblings, but what they had with each other was even deeper. The Bible goes on further to say, The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. What a great example that David and Jonathan are for us today. It is good, yes, even godly, to have friends that we consider to be brothers. Have you told any of your friends that you see this way that you're thankful for them lately? Have you thanked God for them lately? If not, I believe that you should. Now, for different reasons, not everyone here has uh, family members, but everyone can and needs to have friends. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 27, verses 10. It says, Do not forsake your friend or a friend of your family, and do not go to your relative's house when disaster strikes you. Better to have a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. Now, this does not mean that you can't go to your parents for help. Of course you can. But what it does mean is that you do need to have friends that you can go to in times of trouble. When I was attending college at the University of West Georgia, I lived over one hour away from home. So I could call my parents and ask them to come do something for me, but I really didn't have to because I had friends that were there that could help me out. And then if that failed, I also had my aunt and uncle living there in Carrollton as well. Now, the reverse of this also applies for us. Because not only do we need friends to be there for us, we also need to be the friend that God has called us to be. Job chapter 6, verse 14, Job says, Anyone who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of of the Almighty. Now, everyone here, I'm sure, is familiar with the story of Job. Job's friends were not very kind to him, were they? Job's friends told him, hey, just curse God and die, as if you've obviously done something to make God angry. Now, does that sound like something that a real friend would say? Another question to ask you tonight is, do you fear the Lord? It's a hypothetical question, because of course you fear the Lord. But sometimes we don't act like we fear the Lord, do we? We can all think of times when we have held kindness from a friend. But if we fear the Lord, then it is our duty to be kind. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9 says, One who forgives an affront fosters friendship, but one who dwells on dispute will alienate a friend. God is also telling us here to be forgiving. Heed God's advice, for he knows what is best. We cannot control if someone chooses not to forgive us. We can't. But what we can control is our own actions. Now, thinking about Job earlier, if you guys are wondering what happened at the end of that story, Job decided to do the right thing, and he forgave his friend. God was very angry with the false things that Job's friends were saying about God. And God, rightfully so, believed that they should be punished. But he said, I'll tell you what, I won't punish you 
if you do some sacrifices for me and if Job prays for you. And of course, Job did pray for his friends. Let's go to Job chapter 42, verse 10. When Job prayed for his friends, Jehovah restored his fortunes, giving him twice as much as he had before. That is the power of a forgiving heart. The Bible tells us that God forgave them because of Job's prayer. Never underestimate, ladies and gentlemen, the power of prayer and forgiveness. Let's be like Job. Forgive your friends and pray for them. This next point is going to be church, the family that you're born again into. Uh, I thought it was a pretty cheeky title. I like this one. Now, I'm sure once I started this whole sermon, I think in the back of a lot of y'all's minds, y'all kind of knew I was going to this, right? A lot of y'all are thinking, okay, well, when's he going to get to this part of the sermon? Um, our entire lives, we've heard people in our church be called our brothers and sisters. In fact, I think we've heard that so much that a lot of us, um, I just wonder if we're starting to, for, to lose the significance of the word brother. But really take a moment, and I want y'all to take a moment and think about it. Much how like we are born into our physical family, we are born again into our spiritual family. And just like a physical family, we don't get to pick and choose who our spiritual brothers and sisters are. When my biological brothers were born, I didn't get to choose when they were born. They came and I took on the role of big brother. It was natural to me. I never questioned whether or not they would become my best friends. It just happened. Of course they were because they were my brothers. The same needs to be applied to our spiritual brothers and sisters. We don't get to pick and choose who God adds to the church. Once God adds them to the church, they become our brothers and sisters. A verse that I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with is Acts chapter 2, verses 47b. It says, and I emphasize this part here where I underline, it says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Unlike some various religious groups out there, Christians don't get to vote on membership. When someone obeys the gospel, God adds them to the body, period. We can choose our friends, but we cannot choose our spiritual brothers and sisters. Once they are born again, they become a part of our family. I'm thankful for my church family. Some of you in this room I've known my entire life have watched me grow up. Uh, some of you in this room I've known for a decade. But each and every one of you that's in here, despite how long I've known you, if you're part of my church family, you have helped me become the man that I'm standing here today. And I hope that I've helped all of you in some way. I know I could do better, and I need you to keep me accountable to be better. And I also challenge you to be the best brother or sister that you can be. Now, these are not just some lofty ideals that I came up with. This is biblical truth. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, Paul says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, and all purity. Us younger members here in this congregation, we really do need to start looking at the older members here as if they were our parents. And the older members here, you need to start looking at the younger people here as if they were your children. And for those of us that are about the same age, we need to start looking at each other as brothers and sisters. This is not really just a suggestion that I'm giving you, but this is biblical truth, something that God wants for us. And you can see point one and point five, we come back around full circle. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the difference between the first and the fifth one. Well, you know, for, for starters, God is such a special friend that I decided to count him twice. But the first time, when God loves you before you were conceived, God loved you as his creator, and he loved you as his creation. But once we become Christians, we enter even to a deeper relationship with the Lord. 
not just as creation and creator, but as father and children. Due to the Son of God, we ourselves can become sons and daughters of God. God is our Father. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And some of you may be wondering, well, how do we become children of God? Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. One of the main reasons why God sent his son, didn't he? For us to not just be God's beloved creation, but for us to be adopted into sonship as sons and daughters of God. But God is more than just our father. On a little bit more personal level, he's also our brother. Mark chapter 3, verses 35 says, Whoever does the will of God, this is Jesus speaking, he says, Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, is Jesus saying here that he didn't really care about his physical family? Of course not. Of course he loved his physical family. But what Jesus is showing here is that his spiritual family is even more important to him in some ways. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11, uh, the author says here, Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. As I was doing some research on this verse to kind of get my thoughts together and maybe think of an insight to tell you guys, um, I found a really great verse by um, Professor Kaufman, who was professor at Abilene Christian uh, University a few decades ago. Um, but I'm just going to read what he says because I can't say it any better myself. Kaufman says, and he's talking about this verse here, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Kaufman says that Christ is not ashamed to call them brethren is a most instructive thought that the sinless and perfect Savior should not be ashamed of our sinful man, and that his great love for them, so consent to partake of all their sufferings, even death, and should go so as far as to receive them as a spiritual body and make them his bride, that must be held as an attitude of loving grace that beggars all description. Christ will never be ashamed of his brethren. In fact, Mark chapter 8, verses 38, it says that Jesus will confess them before God and before his holy angels. The last point here is that God is our companion. We're going to start off with a verse that's very familiar to each one of you. That is probably a verse that I hear just about every week. Acts 2.38 Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice a particular word here. It says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say you might. It doesn't say you could. It doesn't say it, it'd be nice. It says that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and get a little more information on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Did you guys know that tonight? If not, that's okay. Paul didn't say that you had to get rebaptized if you didn't know that. For whether you knew it or not, this is something that you received upon your baptism along with many other things, such as the forgiveness of your sins. In fact, if I was to list everything that you received in your baptism, we would be here all night. I think I could do a whole Wednesday sermon series on it. I could probably do an entire lectureship based around this theme of all the many wonderful gifts that we receive. 
Um, but for the sake of simplicity tonight, these are two things that you get, and one of them being the companion of the Holy Spirit. Something that was pointed out to me when I was in preaching school by one of my friends, uh, did you know that not only does the Holy Spirit live in our heart, but the Father and the Son does as well? In John chapter 14, verse 23, John says, If anyone loves me, this is Jesus speaking, he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So the ESV says make our home with him. The NASB and the King James Version says they will make their dwelling in us. This is a very old concept that God will be with us wherever we go. Jesus is a well and alive today and makes his home in my heart. That's a song that we often sing here. It's true. Along with the Father and along with the Spirit. And because I do have God as my best friend, and he died, that's why I believe that I'm thankful for Jehovah most of all. Are you a Christian and in need of prayers from your brothers and sisters? Do you have a sin that you want to get off your chest? Or are you lonely and you need some friends, but you're a little too nervous to talk about it? We can help you with that. We'll have some elders up here to receive you when we uh, start our invitational song. Or if you are not a Christian, would you like to know how to become one? We can help you with that too. Because God wants nothing more, nothing more than to call you his son or his daughter for eternity. The song we're about to sing tonight, I was excited when Brady asked me what song that I wanted to start tonight. Because... Uh, we haven't been meeting on at nighttime as often. So, um, without taking up any more of Brady's time for the invitation, let's stand and sing, Oh, Why Not Tonight? 